co-director Lisa Sewell and the Gender and Women's Studies program. I'm really happy to welcome you to the keynote address of the 23rd annual Elizabeth Cady Stanton Research Conference. I also, I want to take a minute to do my thanking. I want to thank the co-sponsors of this lecture, the Department of Political <laughs> Science, Arab and Islamic Studies, and the Center for Peace and Justice. I also want to take a minute to thank the Gender and Women's Studies Steering Committee, especially the committee that is charged with organizing this event, and that's Sherry Bowen, Heidi Rose, Linda Coppell, and Ellen Bonds. I also owe special thanks to our administrative assistant, Joyce Harden, who has done wonderful behind the scenes work and has been escorting our keynote speaker around today. So Joyce, thank you so much. And I also wanted to thank our graduate assistant, Laura Freeman, who is the person standing behind the table out there giving out the programs. Laura did an enormous amount of work to organize the conference today. So thanks to all of you. So we have a round of applause. This is always a wonderful day in which we come together to share the fruits of our research. I was at two really great panels already today to celebrate our commitment to better understanding how gender shapes our world, and to generate renewed energy for making that world more just, more safe, and more gloriously diverse. Uh, I wanted to remind you of one upcoming event. Gender and Women's Studies year has not ended yet. And we have a panel on April 16th um, about Christianity and same-sex relationships titled Swimming Upstream. Um, it's on April 16th. It's going to be here in the cinema at, let me see what time is that, 4.30. So mark that on your calendars and consider coming to that. Now, to get to the business at hand, my distinct privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, Cynthia Enloe. It's especially appropriate to have Professor Enloe with us today because she exemplifies the intellectual passion, commitment to social change, and extraordinary generosity that characterized the life of Elizabeth Cady Stanton herself, social activist for whom this conference is named. Professor Enlo is research professor in the Department of International Development, Community, and Environment and Women's Studies at Clark University. She has published many scholarly articles and 12 books. Most recently, Nemo's War, Emma's War, Making Feminist Sense of the Iraq War. It's a study that examines the experiences of Iraqi and American women in the Iraq War. Professor Emma's other books include Globalization and Militarism, Feminists Make the Link, Maneuvers, The International Politics of Militarizing Women's Lives, <coughs> Bananas, Beaches, and Bases, Making Feminist Sense of International Politics. She's doing a lot of making feminist sense. <laughs> And I have to mention one more because it has an irresistible title and has been translated into multiple languages, a book that came out in the 1980s, Does Khaki Become You? <laughs> the Militarization of Women's Lives. Throughout her long and distinguished career, Professor Enloe has been fearless in venturing into masculinized arenas of international politics and war. In doing so, she has revolutionized our ideas about what counts as international politics. She has consistently posed the question, where are the women in global politics? And she has paid special attention to how women's labor is made cheap in globalized factories, especially sneaker factories, and how women's emotional and physical labor has been used to support governs, government's war waging policies. She's also always interested in how women are resisting those efforts at the same time. She has explored in a host of venues how racial, class, ethnic, and national identities shape ideas about femininities and masculinities. Her career has included Fulbrights in Malaysia and Guyana, guest professorships in Japan, Britain, and Canada, as well as lecturing in Sweden, Norway, Germany, Korea, Turkey, and universities across the United States. Her books and articles have been translated into Spanish, Turkish, Japanese, Korean, Swedish, and German. She's written for Ms. Magazine and has appeared on National Public Radio and the BBC. In 2009, she was awarded an honorary doctorate by the University of London School of Oriental and Asian Studies. She has, in short, been extremely busy. <laughs> 
But perhaps the most remarkable thing about Professor Enlow is her ability to make time to be an exceptional teacher and mentor, even while she has been pursuing her own ambitious research agenda. By all accounts, she is unstintingly generous toward both students and colleagues. At Clark, Professor Enlow has been selected outstanding teacher three times. And in an interview published several years ago, she articulated what was, to me, an especially profound approach to scholarship and teaching. What she said is also characteristic of her in its simplicity and grace. All of us, she said, should learn, quote, how to gain confidence from expressing surprise, from admitting, I should have thought of that, but didn't. The idea that we might gain confidence from acknowledging something we don't know now, that's as revolutionary as it gets. <laughs> With great pleasure, I give you Cynthia Enlow. I'm so pleased to be here. I'm so pleased to be here on this day. I got here early enough to go to a panel this morning. Uh, we talked about um, uh, keeping your gender cap on no matter where you are. Um, and then I, heard, I saw the fantastic performances um, here um, uh, in the middle of the afternoon, which were so gutsy and so eye-opening. I thought they were just fabulous. So I'm delighted to be a small part of such an exciting uh, day. Um, Jean and Lisa and Joyce and all of you who've made it possible for me to come back to Villanova. This is my second time. I, don't, I think it was about 12 years ago somebody said that I um, came to Villanova. Um, so I'm delighted to be back, but I know that the only reason you get here is because it takes a village. And um, so I'm delighted to be um, here as a result of all the work of the village. Um, I thought that it might be good to just start at the beginning, and I won't um, talk very long about this, but I, we are here um, the day after uh, one of the greatest um, contemporary uh, American feminists has died, and that's Adrian Rich. Adrian Rich was formative in the lives and the ideas and the spirit and the energy and the imaginations of so many of us from the 1970s, 80s, 90s, um, and she was a poet. And I think it's one of the things, and this really is in the spirit of the Elizabeth Cady Stanton day, I think, and that is that I saw, I saw Adrian Rich, a poet, read to thousands of people who were so excited they leapt to their feet, right? And it was because she was expressing her feminist ideas through poetry, and she was showing us how poetry illuminates our lives. So if you haven't ever read Adrienne Rich, be sure and get hold of one of her many books of poetry. She's also written essays, and the one that really had a profound effect on me was called Lies, Secrets, and Silences, which has a lot to do with the performances here today. Um, Adrienne Rich. Um, she is really somebody that we are all standing on the shoulders of. If you've never read her, you are still indebted to her. If you've never heard her speak, you are still part of um, the legacy that she has left. Uh, I think at the banquet tonight, Lisa Sewell, who's a co-director of Gender and Women's Studies and also herself a poet, is going to actually talk more about Adrian. I'm not a poet, so I'll leave that to Lisa. But that really does remind me of how there are many different ways to try and express um, feminist ideas and how to explore feminist questions. Jean mentioned that I spent the last five, six, seven years um, trying to make sense of the Iraq war. Now, making sense is an expression, as Jean noted, that I use a lot because it's kind of very gritty and down to earth. It says, can I understand that? Can I make sense of that? If I can't make sense of it, how am I supposed to act in a world that's made up of it? 
And so even though I don't speak Arabic, and I'm embarrassed about that, um, I decided that I would do my best uh, as just one person to make sense of the Iraq war by exploring the lives of eight women. Four, these are all real women, four uh, American women uh, and four Iraqi women. And what I thought I would talk with you today is about just one of those women and why as we now turn the page on Iraq, which is a terrible thing to do, to wage a war for eight years and then act as though we can turn the page. The troops pull out, the evening news stops covering Iraq. No major newspaper except the New York Times has kept a bureau in Baghdad. When media <laughs> conglomerates decide that they can close the office in the main city where the United States has been waging war, you know that you, the citizen, and I, the citizen of the country that has been waging the war, is in deep trouble. Uh, there are still sources um, that you can gather news on Iraq, but you have to be more energetic. The woman I'd like to talk about today is just one of those eight women that I spent seven years trying to understand because I thought if I could make sense of her life, um, it would give me a better avenue into making sense of this war, this very complicated and still not ended war in Iraq. The woman I would like to talk to you about today is a woman named Nimmo, N-I-M-O, Nimmo. Um, and she is uh, not a woman who makes headlines. The only reason we know something about Nimmo is because one New York Times reporter uh, named um, Sabrina Tavernese, uh, who was stationed in Baghdad in the early years of the war, decided, I don't know whether Sabrina has ever taken a women's studies course, but she acts as though she did. Because what she learned was that one, one of the places that you go to cover a war is a beauty parlor. You don't necessarily have to be embedded with the Marines. You don't necessarily have to be in the corridors of power all of which Sabrina Tavernese does. She's now in Afghanistan. Um, but you go to a beauty parlor. That is, what she had learned was that politics takes place in a lot of different venues, in a lot of different places that most people discount as being apolitical or non-political or even more arrogantly pre-political. But she didn't think that. She thought, I should spend a day in a very, very modest beauty parlor. Um, Nimmo's, and it was called Nimmo's Beauty Parlor in Arabic, um, and it's on a kind of back alley um, in the central uh, district of Baghdad, right close to what the Americans began to call uh, the Green Zone, which was a multi-mile, not just acre, multi-mile, district that they took over from Saddam Hussein and made into their own headquarters. It is now the Green Zone, it is now uh, the main headquarters for the um, Iraqi government under Prime Minister Maliki. So Nimmo had a prime location, but not a fancy one. And here's what we learned by paying attention to a woman running a small beauty parlor. First of all, we learned that women who were both covered, that is, wore scarves over their uh, head, um, and those who weren't, seemed to be quite at ease coming together at Nemo's to get facials, to get their nails um, manicured, to have their hair done. And secondly, um, that some of the women saw themselves as Shiite, some saw themselves as Kurdish, some saw themselves as Christian, some saw themselves as Sunni, but at this point, you always have to keep track of the timeline, right? At this point, this is about 2003, about April, that's one month into the US invasion, about April in 2003, all those women felt it completely unexceptional to be in the same place and chatting with each other and chatting with Nemo. Now already, um, there was problems with water 
and with electricity. And this is going to have a profound effect on women's lives. That is that so much of women's lives depends on access to electricity and to water. And they sound very mundane, but they affect women's ability to work for pay, as Nimmo was, or for them to do unpaid housework. Um, at already, by April, the electricity and the water uh, sources in her small beauty parlor um, were beginning to become erratic. They would then become almost non-existent for the next four years, and now, eight years into the American occupation, with the Americans just having left, it is not yet up to what it was at the time of the U.S. beginning of invasion, that is, the sources of electricity and water. And it was one of the topics of conversation amongst Nimmo and her clientele. One of the things they wanted to talk about with each other was, are you getting electricity? How are you dealing without water? Now, this is April. April is quite a pleasant time in Baghdad. By the time you get to July and August, about what's the normal daytime temperature in Baghdad in July and August? 110? Now, that doesn't, it means that you don't only not have your air conditioning, you don't have an electric fan, and you don't have reliable sources of water. So that was one thing that they wanted to talk about. They wanted to talk about war, electricity, and water. That's very serious wartime talk. The other thing they wanted to talk about that day, and this wasn't, this wasn't exceptional, this was just customers coming and going, the other thing they wanted to talk about was, have you heard about the kidnappings? What are you doing about the kidnappings? Have you tried to go to the police about the kidnappings? What do they say? What they talked about was, can you rely on the police? And one of the first things you learned by spending time with Nimmo and her customers was that with the US invasion, there was the dismantlement, quite deliberately, of the um, government's police force, uh, as well as the military. And at the same time, the government, the U.S. occupying um, administration uh, was supposed to be building up a new police force, but the new police force was being trained in not things like schoolgirls kidnapping. They were being trained in anti-terrorism, so that a lot of the conversation amongst Nimmo and her women customers was around security as defined by women in their ordinary lives. So two things already we know we would be likely to miss if we didn't pay serious attention to somebody like Nimmo. One is that when you think about wartime, think about the gendering of electricity and the gendering of water. Two, when you think about wartime, think whose definition of security have you adopted, sometimes unthinkingly, and think what are the alternative definitions of security, measures of security. And for these women, one of them was physical safety outside your house. And secondly, the safety of your daughters, that is, could you afford, in security terms, could you dare to let your girls go to school? Um, given how lawless uh, Baghdad had become. The other reason that Nimmo caught my attention was because she was earning her own living. She owned this small beauty parlor. Again, nothing fancy, but she was able to survive as a small uh, business owner. And this got me really interested in something that I had really, you know, it's one of those things where you think, oh, damn, I should have thought of that. And then you think, I wonder why I didn't. So, but Nimmo really nudged me, pushed me into thinking more about the history of the politics of women's paid work in Iraq. And what I discovered from a colleague of mine, Nadia Al-Ali, who's a British, German, Iraqi, uh, and who teaches in London. And Nadia wrote a wonderful book about the based on interviews with the women who were the early activists in the Iraqi women's movement. We're celebrating Elizabeth Cady Stanton. We've been 
talked a bit about our debt to Adrian Rich. Well, Iraqis also have had a women's movement, and the women's movement in Iraq started in the 1920s, and a lot of the people that Nadja interviewed were activists from that era, and especially when it got into full force around the late 50s into the early 60s. And the issue that a lot of Iraqi activist women were pushing in the 1950s and 60s and 70s was women's access to paid work. Because as you all know from taking any kind of course on women's history or gender in society or feminist economics, is there a course on feminist economics at Villanova? Mm, think about that, folks. Um, <laughs> Because there's a whole journal, there's a whole international journal of feminist economics, so it's not an oxymoron. Um, but one of the things we know from uh, the history of women's movements in many countries is that access to paid labor is considered by many women who become advocates for women's rights to be crucial for women's rights because without access to their own paid work, that is, their own paycheck that they get on the basis of their own labor. Without that, there is no hope for being able to end a harmful marriage. There is no hope for being able to have a voice in civic society. There is no hope for being able to claim that you contribute um, in a meaningful, accountable way, because economists do not count unpaid labor everybody. One of the hardest things for feminists to do is to get the World Bank to start counting unpaid labor. But since that's still a very big project, um, in fact, if you cannot show in dollars and cents and with numbers that you contribute to the formal economy, that's called the paid economy, of a country, you have much less say in the running of that country. So since the 19, well really, since the 1920s onwards, Iraqi women have organized to push for women's access to paid labor. Now, this makes Nemo very, very interesting for a reason you might not think about and I didn't think about. And that was she owned her own small business. But actually, by about, you have to be somewhat precise on this, by about 1980, most, the majority, I should say, not, not all certainly, but the majority of Iraqi women who had paid jobs as engineers, women were getting higher education, as engineers, as teachers, as doctors, as museum curators, as accountants, those, the majority of women who had paid jobs by the 1980s in Iraq were working for the government, were working for a really quite expansive state economy. And when Saddam Hussein came in with the Ba'athist party, and you know he was the head of a very particular political party, the Ba'athist party, um, one of the things he wanted to do was to modernize Iraq. He was a great modernizer, and he saw that the way to modernize Iraq was to give in to women's advocates who were pushing for women's education and women's paid labor. Just like Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam and many radical um, activists who want to modernize their own countries, they realize you cannot modernize a country if 50% of your talent and your skill and your energy is kept out of the paid labor force. So Saddam Hussein, not because he was a feminist, but because he was fixed on modernizing Iraq, especially so that Iraq would no longer be under the thumb of the British, the formal, former colonizers of Iraq. He gave in to the advocates push for women's education and women's access to the paid labor force, but at the same time, Saddam Hussein also thought that more and more of the economy should come under the umbrella of the state, especially, of course, the oil economy. But not only the oil economy, museums and hospitals and schools, 
and all kinds of engineering projects. So by the 1980s, two things were going on. One is that more and more women were going into the paid labor force. Many of them were going into the paid labor force as professionals. Is this the description, by the way, we all got back in 2003? Were there lead stories in the American media on the history of the, of the Iraqi women's movement? There is a wit, an American wit, named Ambrose Pierce, who in the 1890s, some of you know this, said, and it makes a, gr I have the bumper sticker, but he, he did, at that point in 1890s, didn't have it as a bumper sticker, right? He said, think of it now, this way. he said, war, colon, the way Americans er learn geography. That is, we learn about places by going to war there. What's the proper sequence? You learn and then you decide whether, in fact, going to war there will be of any use to anybody. But as a result, most of us, and I'm included, had no idea that by the, 18, by the 1980s, um, in fact, many Iraqi women were dependent on their economic livelihoods on jobs with the government. The Iraq war that we've just, well, that the Americans have just pulled their troops out of, is the third war that most Iraqis, who are now middle-aged, have lived through. The first war was the Iran-Iraq War, 1980 to 88, a brutal, devastating war for both the Iranians and for the Iraqis. Which side did the American government support in the Iran versus the Iraq war? Iraq. And that's why Saddam Hussein's military had so many American arms, because we had actually been providing those arms. Um, the second war was as a result of Saddam Hussein's imperialist, expansionist objectives, where he, try, where he tried and unsuccessfully occupied um, Kuwait in 1990-91. And as a result of that, and being defeated, and his military being driven back into Iraq, um, as a result of that, the United States, with other supporters in the United Nations Security Council, um, devised and imposed very, very drastic econo international economic sanctions on Iraq. And Iraq, another Iraqi British feminist investigator, and she did this for her thesis, by the way, she decided she'd do a gender analysis of the international economic sanctions on Iraq. That is, did women and men experience in the 1990s, from 1991 to 2003, did women and men in Iraq experience international economic sanctions identically? And here's what she found, and she found by looking at all the raw data, she was a great data cruncher, right? But she also interviewed men and women within households in three different social classes in Baghdad. It's a great combination of ethnography and number crunching. And what she found was this, that because such a high proportion, this is all about Nimmo now, because such a high proportion of Iraqi women by the late 20th century had become dependent for their paid employment on jobs in the state, big state sector, whether they be accountants or engineers or doctors or museum curators or theater directors. When the economic sanctions were imposed by the United Nations with great strong backing from the United States, the state sector, this was all to punish Saddam Hussein, right, for the invasion of Kuwait, but there was no gender analysis of what the international sanctions would do. And what they did was they, of course, shrank, radically shrank the state sector. That is, 
Saddam Hussein, now under international sanctions, began to have to close down state companies. He had to close down state departments. He had to shrink the employment pool of the government. And women were more likely to lose jobs than men. It doesn't mean that the international sanctions didn't hurt a lot of Iraqi men. It did. But proportionately, it hurt more women than men. The second part of losing your job in the 1990s, this is all just leading up to what we think of as the Iraq War. The second part of it is that when men lost their jobs, which was tough, very tough, and they had to scramble to find some alternative employment in the private sector, because there was a private sector in Iraq, they could scramble and maybe not get as good a job, but could, they were likely to get some kind of employment in the private sector. But it turns out that women were considered respectable. Respectability is such a powerful political idea. Always investigate it. Always listen for it. Always keep your gender hat on when you hear anybody talking about a respectability. It turns out that in Iraq, in the 1990s into the early 2000s and today, but especially in that time period, women who worked in the state sector, even if they worked with male colleagues in the same banking office or in the same hospital, they were considered respectable women, still could be good wives, still could be marriageable. They weren't considered endangering their status as a respectable woman if they worked for a state office. But if with the shrinkage, thanks to the international sanctions, if with the shrinkage they went and tried to use their exact same skills in a private bank or in a private clinic or in a private engineering firm or a com private computer firm, they were much more likely to think of themselves but also their mothers and their fathers and their older brothers and their boyfriends, all of whom weigh in on notions of feminine respectability. They were much likely, more likely to be thought of as jeopardizing their feminine respectability if they worked in the private sector. So do a gender analysis of the international economic sanctions post what's called the Gulf War by Americans. And what you find is that women lost a lot of their economic security in the 1990s. And so that means by, at the verge, at just at the beginning of the US invasion, women's economic conditions were in very precarious shape. But that makes Nimmo interesting. Nimmo's in the private sector, right? She's in the retail sector, which is oftentimes quite precarious for women. But she has a women-only customer base. So what we learn is that in, by 2003, women as beauty parlor workers and beauty parlor owners were, had become a really crucial sector of women's paid employment. So, two things. One, think about a beauty parlor when you want to know where people are talking politics and measuring their security and insecurity. Secondly, when you think about war, think about women's paid employment and men's paid employment and think about them distinctly. Keep track of both, but don't imagine that they are following the same path for the same reasons. That's 2003. But you know, one of the things I learned by following these four American women and these four Iraqi women was that wars have distinctly gendered phases. I'd never really thought about this before. I mean, I, I know that the Americans and the British during World War II didn't want to use married women at first. Then they were pushed to use married women. Then they were pushed to use married women with children. So I knew that as wars get longer and longer, people who are in power violate more and more of their own sexist presumptions about women. All right? That is that, now, 
that what the phrase they use, and you know this from watching World War II films or stories set in World War II, want the people in power who hold on desperately to their cherished notions about what a proper woman should do, what they do is use the phrase, for the duration. Have you heard that phrase? It comes up in all kinds of World War II stories. And for the duration is really people who have cherished notions of what women and men should do think that when they violate those, because the war has gotten too long, because the body count's too high, because they're under more pressure than they ever imagined in this war, what they hope is that they'll violate those presumed roles, but only for the duration. Which means what they imagine is Rosie the Riveter will happily, happily go back to the kitchen in 1946. Right? What if Rosie doesn't want to go back? What if Rosie has learned that actually being a welder, and she wasn't a riveter, by the way, because riveters got paid more, so Rosie actually was trained in those armament factories in Detroit and Cleveland and Philadelphia and the shipyard, was trained as a welder. So it was really Rosie the welder. But Rosie the welder was making more money than she was when she was picking cotton, than she was when she was working in the school cafeteria, than she was when she wasn't earning any pay at all. And the, for the duration presumption is that women will be happy to give up their well-paid jobs and all the autonomy that goes with having good pay when the guys come home and the government absolutely is terrified of, terrified of alienated male veterans. And therefore, out of that fear, needs women to give up their autonomy and their decent pay and re-embrace unpaid or low-paid work. In Iraq, we learned that the war there also has gone through gendered phases. And one of the things I learned by following Nimmo was that at about year two of the Iraq war, so this is by about 2004, maybe late 2004, one of the things that began to pop up if you really watched down in the news and you just kind of kept track of it, it's going to be one of these things that you're just going to watch for even if it's not the main story, even if it's not, and usually wasn't the headline. And that is the firebombing of Iraqi beauty parlors. That is about two years into the Iraq war, beauty parlors owned by Iraqi women and staffed by Iraqi women became the targets of these new armed Iraqi militias that, of course, the American government hadn't counted on at all, hadn't prepared for, didn't understand, both Sunni-driven militias and Shiite-driven militias. And some of those militias, and in many wars, you always have to ask who is in an insurgent force, who is in a militia, and never assume that they're all male, but also never assume that they're mixed men and women. You always have to ask. From what we know in Iraq, virtually all the militias, armed militias, that began to organize and become such a powerful force in public life by 2004 and still today, were all male. They were not a mix of men and women. And some of these all-male militias began to target beauty parlors. Now, we don't have enough, we don't have any really, we have very few first-hand accounts of what motivated men who took up arms and operated within these militias. This is not within the new U.S. trained Iraqi military. This is not private contractors, of which there were a proliferation. But these were militias, and they were very sectarian driven, most of them. That is, they either identified as Sunni or as Shiite. We do know that they got paid, and that for a lot of young men, any source of income um, was really important. Some of it went to supporting their parents. 
So we do know that a lot of the militias were getting enough money to pay their armed militiamen. But we don't know why they targeted women's beauty parlors. There are a couple of hints. So this is a research agenda for all of you. Find out why. One of the things we've got a hint about is that in the midst of war, in any society, including the American society in each one of the American wars, there is that sense that the social fabric is coming unfrayed. It's coming apart. That whatever you thought was not just the social order, but the social um, trust, the bonds, predictability doesn't mean that your social fabric doesn't mean that you like everybody else in your society. Social fabric means there's some understanding that there are common rules of interaction. There are common understandings about status and about relationships and about processes. And it, one of the things that war does is it really frays that social fabric. And it causes people to be very frightened. Because one, you can't tell who to trust. Two, you can't tell who you are in the midst of this society. And in the midst of that kind of social fabric unraveling, oftentimes, nothing automatic about this, so you have to ask, but it certainly happened in Iraq, oftentimes the desire to control women becomes even more fierce. Because for a lot of people, the assumption is if you cannot control girls and women, you cannot have a social order. And beauty parlors, for some men, looked as though they, even though they had existed since the 1930s, especially since international cinema made a, women's beauty um, hairstyles much more publicly accessible. You could see it on the big silver screen. The rise of the international cinema and the rise of the beauty parlor are evidently very closely um, dovetailed. But for a lot of men in these militias, the beauty parlor looked as though it was the heart of the threat to the social fabric they thought was what the Iraqi nation should be. So the attack on beauty parlors was not just random and it was not just crazy. It was part and parcel of that sense of insecurity, particularly masculinized insecurity, about the social fabric that comes about in the middle of a war, especially a war you don't know is going to end. Let me just make one other thought here, or introduce one other thought about Nimmo and about what happened to the women whose beauty parlors were firebombed. A lot of them became refugees. And to become a refugee in Iraq, depends how good your geography is after eight years of waging war in a country. Do you know what countries border on Iraq? Name one country that borders on Iraq. Say it again. Iran. Iran is one. And in fact, hundreds of thousands of Iraqis sought refuge in Iran. You don't think of Iran as a big um, host of refugees, but in fact, it became it in the Iraq war. What other countries? Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia less so, Jordan. Jordan, and Syria, and Syria. Now Syrians are fleeing into Iraq as well as into Turkey. But in the Iraq war, one million Iraqis fled to Jordan, especially to the capital city Amman and 100 Iraqi, 1 million Iraqis fled to Syria. So at a time when the American discourse was around Syria as the axis of evil, in fact, it was taking 1 million refugees from a war being waged by the United States in Iraq. And amongst those refugees were many women who owned beauty parlors who had been firebombed. <clears throat> 
And so if you follow Nimmo, you start thinking about what is the experience of a woman who becomes a refugee. And here's one of the things we know, and we know because there's so many more women who have a feminist awareness and feminist skills working now in refugee agencies. If any of you are interested in what to do with your gender and women's studies skills, think about international agencies. Almost every international agency now has a gender mandate, which means they have to have people with gender skills. So if you're doing gender and women's studies or you want to explain to your parents why you're going to take gender and women's studies, say it's because you really want a great job with the United Nations or the International Committee of the Red Cross or many other NGOs. They all have mandates now where they have to be able to act out uh, gender analysis. And what we know from those international agency people who are trying to help refugees, particularly in Jordan and in Syria, that's in Damascus and Amman, is that many women came with their dependent children. And they had to support those children as refugees without working papers. Now you can imagine where this is going to go. Yeah, I see the shaking of heads. Many Iraqi women Middle-class women, didn't matter whether you were trained as an engineer or whether you had worked as a, a nurse's aide. Many of them went into prostitution in Damascus and in Amman. And they went in secretly because your hope is that you'll support your kids as a refugee, but you will eventually be able to go back home. And nobody will know what you did to support your kids and yourself when you are forced to become a refugee. So you follow Nimmo and you begin finding yourself doing feminist analysis of international refugees. At this point, more and more Iraqis are trying to come home. But as they try to come home, they are faced with insecurity. And you can listen to women and men and boys and girls trying to assess Security. That is, is it secure enough to go home? And what do you use as your measure? Your access to paid work? You still need an income. What kind of paid work is now left in Iraq? What kind of new economy is being built in Iraq? Who's being hired in government agencies now in Iraq? And you think about physical security. Do the police now, all the police have been trained by the United States, do the police now care more about women's physical security than they did eight years ago or not. So paying attention to just one ordinary Iraqi woman makes you so much more, makes us all so much more realistic about what goes on in a war and when a war has ended and what does post-war look like if you insist upon keeping your eyes, your feminist eyes, wide open. Thank you very much. Do they want to take some questions? Yes, yeah, so okay. Yeah, yeah. Question? We have time for stories. I love, you know, we we still don't know what this thing called the Iraq War and the Afghan, Afghanistan War is. We still don't know what it is, right? Tell stories. We've got a, a mic here, I think. You don't have to walk up here. You, don't, you can be shy. Where is this turned on? Has anybody had any experience, or you know a friend who's had an experience, or you know somebody from Afghanistan or Iraq who's come to the United States? Somebody's saying that somebody should speak. I can tell. Yeah. Yes, hi. hi. I, I don't think I need a mic. I have That's a lot good. good. Okay, just, yeah. Um, I, I actually have been uh, inspired by your, your work. Um, I oh, work on uh, prostitution myself. Wow. And uh, I focus on Japan in the post war period. Oh, very good. Um, and I would during the American during occupation. During the American occupation. So your work has been very. Uh, instructional to me. Oh, thank you. But um, I'd like to 
to hear you speak a little bit more about prostitution in the green zone or within uh, Iraq today and who the women doing this work might be. Um, that's my yeah. Um, we know much too little about how prostitution is carried on and how organized it is, that is how systematic it is inside Iraq. When the American military operates in Korea and in, still in Japan and in Okinawa, the small southern island of Japan, um, it operates under rules that allow for large entertainment businesses, entertainment, um, to operate around uh, local entertainment business to operate around the U.S. bases. And Korean feminists, Filipino feminists, um, and uh, Japanese feminists are the ones who've actually taught all of Americans, if you pay attention, those three groups of feminists, Korean feminists, South Korean feminists, Japanese, particularly Okinawan feminists, and um, um, Filipino feminists, are the ones who have told Americans, here's how your base prostitution system works. So we are totally indebted to them and now to new work that's being done by you as well. Um, in, um, in Iraq, as well as in Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, um, the United States, and as well as in Bosnia, where the United States is still part of a NATO peacekeeping operation, the, the Pentagon introduced a different social interaction rule. That is, they custom designed a social interaction rule for where they were operating. In Asia, interaction between American troops, especially when they're off duty on R&R, as they say, rest and recreation, is not breaking the rules. But in Bosnia and in Saudi Arabia and in Bahrain and in Iraq and in Afghanistan, the Pentagon introduced what is called a non-fraternization rule. It doesn't mean that they can't hang out with their brothers. It means that they cannot, it's a large umbrella here, you cannot interact with the social, with the uh, local public, which means that American soldiers cannot go off base except on missions. And therefore, no entertainment zones have grown up around what, until last year, there were 105 US bases in Iraq. And of some very large, some smaller. But none of them had entertainment districts around them because US military personnel got no leave in order to go to entertainment off base. That changed the economies of prostitution. Now, what is true, however, is that there is increasing prostitution that began in Iraq um, actually um, during and shortly after the Iran-Iraq um, war, and we know this from Iraqi scholars, that more and more women became impoverished when they became widowed. There are now several hundred thousand Iraqi women who are widows. Now think of what's happened to women's paid employment opportunities. It doesn't mean there are fewer children. And many of those women we now know from Iraqi activists um, have gone into quite informal, small-scale prostitution. It doesn't mean that they control their own bodies, but it's not necessarily as highly organized as it is around US bases in South Korea, for instance. Um, also, there is now more and more reporting coming out of sex trafficking by syndicates out of Iraq into the rest of the region. That is, one of the things that happens in wartime is that girls, I think watch for girls, don't just watch for adult women. Girls and women, as they become more vulnerable, become more accessible to organized international sex traffickers. That is happening in the Congo, that is happening in Bosnia, that is happening in many war zones. 
if you wanted to do a map of the world and you didn't know much, and you thought, well, I'll just start out by trying to guess what are the main sources for trafficked, usually brutalized, trafficked girls and women, the first thing you do is you do a map of where the war zones are. Because that's most likely to be the major places from which women and girls, without protection, without working law enforcement, without working customs officials, or with a lot of corruption, are available, if you will, to traffickers. So what we know in Iraq is that there, is, there has been growing prostitution out of um, a sense of economic necessity um, since the late 1980s, and it accelerated as soon as the United States invasion really took force. Um, it doesn't mean that the United States military has given up prostitution. It just means it's not the main organizer of it the way it is in, around some of their other bases. Yeah, great, great question, great research. What other kinds of things do you all think about? Yeah, hi. Well, based on what you learned, what do you, what do you think the future looks like for the women in Iraq? Well, from Iraqi women themselves, they've been trying to organize um, independent NGOs ever since 2003. Um, the space for organizing isn't very great, right? One, it's dangerous. And two, um, the legal space isn't very great. What most Iraqi, because um, Iraqi, feminists and Iraqi women's advocates, they write a lot, they go to conferences, they, you know, a lot of it's in Arabic. Um, but one of the things they say is that they are particularly worried about the way the U.S. supervised constitution has been written. And there's an article called Article 41. You know, if you're a, if you're a feminist in a war zone and a new constitution's being written, you have to be really on your toes, right? And there's Article 41 in the current Constitution, which has an opening for um, religious clerics to have uh, special authority in some areas that are particularly of concern to women. And that's usually referred to as the family code. And the family code, which you find in many um, countries, especially if they've been under any um, French influence, it's very Napoleonic, the family code, but what it covers and why it's so greatly of concern to feminists in each of these countries, in Morocco, in Algeria, in Iraq, in Egypt, is child custody, divorce, marriage, and inheritance. And insofar as it looks as though, because Saddam Hussein, who was, of course, autocratic and violent, an expansionist. He was also a secularist. Right? And what it now looks like is there's much more authority to the all-male clerical um, hierarchy now through Article 41. And that's what a lot of Iraqi women have been trying to focus on. Other Iraqi women have organized widows groups so that widows won't be so destitute. They've organized um, uh, uh, local um, Organ, uh, uh, local groups to, to encourage women to go into electoral politics and learn about electoral politics. Then, uh, and there's a lot of organizing just around uh, job skills, computer skills. Right. So as in any country, as in the United States, there's not sort of one monolithic Iraqi women's movement. But there is a sense that the war both seem to have opened some spaces and really closed down a lot of spaces for Iraqi women. A lot of Iraqi women say they were best off in about 1970. Yeah. So progress for women doesn't just go like that. Right? Uh, there's no such thing as momentum. Right? So it's a very interesting thing to watch. And if you watch women's e-news, which is one of the best computer sources for news about women in the world, women's e-news is one of the best ways to keep up on Iraqi uh, women's politics. Yeah, hi. With the increase in prostitution and desperation that has taken place, 
culture of today? Is it something that was even being given a name to address? Yes, I mean, Iraq had the one of the most highly developed public health systems in all of the Middle East before 1990. So there is a very, there was a very elaborate um, hospital system, clinical system, training of doctors and nurses. So certainly things are named, they, they, but there is of course a shortage of, of drugs. One of the things that a lot of the militias, these armed militias that really came into the fore in the midst of the American occupation, particularly 2006, 2007, when the militias were at their peak, but they, as I say, they still exist. They tried to drive out um, professionals and they aimed at doctors and nurses. And so a lot of the Iraqis that have gone into exile are disproportionately from those necessary um, professions that you would need to really handle wartime um, uh, medical crises. Um, and there's a lot of concern about how to woo back doctors and nurses that were forced out by the militias who saw the professionals as a, another threat to what they hoped would be the remaking of their Iraqi social fabric. A lot of professors were also uh, assassinated and driven out. Doctors were assassinated, professors were assassinated, and those who survived assassination oftentimes fled, men and women. Other things? One more thought, question. Yes, yeah, Jean. I wondered if in your short time remaining, you also write in your book about American women's experiences mm -hmm. in the Iraq war. And could you obviously not anything like Nimmo's experience, mm. a completely different set of questions you would ask. But I just wanted to share some of what you Yeah, one of the things that I found um, I won't go and give you a whole other lecture, but I'll just tell you, because I tried to figure out, well, so who should I look at? And again, I did not want to take Condoleezza Rice. I didn't want to take people who are well known. I didn't take Lindy England, although I'm very interested in um, her um, experiences. And, uh, okay, uh, look out, so you, you know, you ask a question like that and sh she, she's off and there you are, you know, desperate for supper. Um, <laughs> But I'll tell, I'll tell you who the four women were that I decided on. I decided on a woman named Kim, who's out in San Francisco, who was only about 31 when um, her husband, Mike, who was in the California National Guard um, as a military police officer, was deployed to Iraq. And I got really interested in how targeted she was. That's the only term I can think of, very militarized term. How targeted she was by the Pentagon. Now she was not a member of the military, but the US Pentagon has become very savvy in gender and warfare, in since, particularly since the 1980s. I know some of the women who do this work inside the Pentagon and they really think they're trying to be of help to American women who are military wives. But what Kim found was that she was asked by the Pentagon to take care of that means the broken down furnaces, the how do you get food stamps, what to do with a sick child, how to take care of all the wives of Mike's men. And so at two and three in the morning, she was answering the phone and trying to handle the problems of military families, which of course suggests that to wage a war, even a very powerful country, a very wealthy country, a very technologically savvy military, takes a woman doing unpaid labor for the Pentagon at two in the morning. And if you tallied up the cost of the war included Kim, all the Kims, it would look like a much more expensive war. The second woman I looked at is a woman who's in the title of the book. The title is Nemo's War, Emma's War. And Emma is a Latina, um, a woman in San Antonio, Texas, and I got really interested in her because one of her sons was in the Air Force, but stationed in Alaska. She was so happy. Alaska seemed like really far away from Iraq. But her teenage son was in the San Antonio high schools, and the San Antonio high schools let military recruiters have full run 
of the school, not just the cafeteria, but classrooms. And she, although she's very pro-military, uh, Badoy, Emma Badoy is, she really didn't want her teenage son to go into the military. So it allowed me to talk about how the Pentagon thinks about mothers. And if you go onto any of the Air Force, Navy, Marines, or Army websites, you will see whole websites focused not just on mothers, but on Latina mothers, not much on Latina fathers. The Pentagon has a whole ad campaign and edit, uh, aimed at mothers to make them think that their sons, not so much daughters, but particularly their sons going to the military is good for their mothering. The third woman is um, a woman named um, uh, Danielle Green. And Danielle Green, do any of you have friends who are at Notre Dame, who've gone to Notre Dame University or, you know, just you just hope Vill Villanova beats Notre Dame, right? That's all you care, okay. Um, but um, Danielle Green was a um, basketball star, a woman basketball star when she was at um, uh, Notre Dame. And she decided to join the military after college, not as a way to pay for college, but after college. And she also became a, an army a military police officer and she was severely injured and lost. She was a left-handed basketball star, and she lost her left arm in um, Baghdad. And I wanted to understand how watching, she's African-American, I wanted to understand how paying attention to an African-American young woman in the US military allows you to think about women in the military and women um, as, as veterans. And the last woman I chose was a woman named Charlene Kane, who's up in a town, a rural town called Berlin, Wisconsin. And Charlene's young son, another Mike, Michael, uh, went into the military, and she was a little doubtful, but he was working at Walmart shelving light bulbs and was really at loose ends, a real couch potato. And, um, and she wasn't keen about him going in, but he seemed so more purposeful once he enlisted. And he came, he was also severely injured as a truck driver uh, by an IED bomb on the side of the road. And he came back and lost his left leg. And he was very athletic before. And I wanted to understand the ways in which the whole military war waging system depends on mothers picking up the pieces actually mothers and wives of severely injured soldiers, men and women, how they're counted on to pick up the pieces, which again underscored for me, I think, Jean, how much more expensive this war is than anybody tallies. And that's what a feminist analysis does. That's what a feminist curiosity does. It makes you more realistic about how you define security and how you get it and who's got it and at what cost, and it makes you more realistic, more down to earth about what does it cost to use the military to carry out foreign policy. Thank you all very much.